Hey everybody, you are listening to the Vocal Advancement Podcast and I am your host Tom and I'm with my lovely co-host Heather today. Ahoy! Ahoy to you too. <laughs> <laughs> what country of the world is that from? <laughs> that is uh, Czech Republic. Huh? Or actually, uh, I noticed in in uh, Eurovision they no longer want to be referred to as Czech Republic. They are so che- Czechia now. Czechia now? Yeah. Yes. That's such Very a nice. diva thing for a country to do. Like, no. Artist formerly known as. <laughs> <laughs> we are now Czechia. Why not? Let's uh, rebrand. Yeah. Didn't Ooh. an artist, famous artist, change their name recently as well? I thought I saw somebody had changed their name. They were no longer going by something. I don't know. Oh, that's going to bug me. I'll remember as soon <laughs> as we finish recording. I'll be like, oh, it was so-and-so, so-and-so. They've changed their name <laughs> They were going by a band name, but now they're going by their their name. Their individual name. Mm. There you go. Why oh, well. not? Sometimes, sometimes you need a rebrand. Sometimes yeah. you need to reinvent yourself. Look at Madonna. How many times has she reinvented herself? <laughs> oh, it works. Mm. It works. <laughs> yeah, she's been in the business for how many years now? 40? Maybe more? That's, that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's crazy. Speaking of the business, Beyonce was in town on Saturday. We had tea. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> if only <laughs> but she was in town <laughs> i was gonna say she's been doing the rounds she's been around she the uk has. hasn't she i keep seeing uh clips of her concerts coming up on tiktok i haven't I've, that's the first one i've actually seen and it just happened it was from edinburgh and i was like i want because we were sitting we're like what is that music like because it sounds like you can hear in the distance just like loud music oh, wow. and we're like, what is going on completely forgot beyonce so apparently it was pandemonium in town on Saturday. wow fifty thousand people well from what i can see from all these tiktok videos she seems to be having a competition between cities to see who could sing love on top best oh and i'm like I missed that. of all the songs she could try and get the crowd to sing. <laughs> Love on Top is one of those songs that singers bring us because it's like, this is my nemesis. There's about approximately three million key changes in mm-hmm. that song. <laughs> yeah. And each time it goes up, it gets progressively more challenging for the singer. So to try and get an entire crowd full of people to join in on that one. Good luck to him. <laughs> I know. And have you ever seen the performance she did just before she went to retire to have her baby where she sang that and then she popped the jacket at the end to reveal that she was like four or five months pregnant and had just sung it live while dancing about the stage? Yeah, well, that's just, There's no hope for anybody else. Unhuman, really, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I still remember the story somebody told me that when they were the summer camp that her dad, was it her dad or somebody used to do with her and the other two girls from Destiny's Child, they used to do summer camps to get them ready for being superstars. So they used to have to run in like the Texas heat on treadmills or something like that, getting ready to be fit Whoa. so they could sing and run and stuff. Yeah. Paid off. J- jog training is a thing, isn't it? I've seen a few. Yeah. And six People inch heels though. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Some people struggle to just walk, never mind run and sing. <laughs> oh, I've got to tell you, I went to see um, I went to see a local theatre company that I now do uh, their production of Sweetie Todd the other day. And oh. I took um, one of the teachers who works in my studio with me, Amy. Uh, and if she's listening to this, she'll already be laughing because talking about shoes, I came out of the interval. Now, bear in mind, we've been through COVID times. There's a lot of heels in the back of my wardrobe that have not <laughs> seen the light of day since pre-COVID times. <laughs> And I pulled out these heels that I hadn't worn for a very long time. And as we were walking out in the interval, the entire sole of the shoe just <laughs> decided to come away from the rest of the <laughs> shoe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I thought I'd tripped over something, but it was the sole of the shoe coming off. And then, and then, like, the whole thing came off. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> shove it in my handbag. Uh, <laughs> the, the heel was still there, but because there was no kind of platform on it, one of my, my shoes was now, like, a good inch and a half <laughs> taller than the other one. So I'm hobbling around. <laughs> Amy was wetting herself, laughing at me. <laughs> and then on the way out at the end, the other side decided to start coming loose. So I was trying to go back to the car. I was walking like, you know, hunchback of Notre Dame, dragging a foot behind me so that I wasn't... Yeah, I'm a, I'm a class act. I'm telling you something. Oh, you probably <laughs> upstaged the show. <laughs> 
Things you don't expect. I don't get out much, you see, obviously. I don't, I don't put my heels on very often these days. Well, see, now it'll be a memorable. Remember that time you went to see Sweeney Todd? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my shoe was falling off. But there we go. And you were out gallivanting as well, weren't you? You were at Eurovision. I did. I went to Eurovision the other week. Oh, Tom, it was so much fun. It was the campest, just most amazing party in the world. And, um, yeah, I had so much fun that I was already Googling as soon as I knew who won Eurovision. I was already Googling flights <laughs> to Sweden. I'm like, I wonder how much it would cost to go and watch it in Sweden. It was a lot of we'll fun. And Liverpool did a fantastic job of hosting the competition. Yeah, they seemed like from, a really good crowd. Yeah, it, and just it was just very, very kind of, um, they embraced it because anybody who doesn't know anything about Eurovision, it's my, my little guilty pleasure is Eurovision. And obviously, if you're not from Europe or Australia, <laughs> randomly, uh, you, you wouldn't have a clue what this is. And it's a huge, huge um, international competi- song competition where originally it was all the countries of Europe would bring a song, mm-hmm. but now... Israel gets involved, and so does Australia. So there's a few extra countries. Um, but it is like a huge party. It is a huge party. And I'll tell you what, I did a couple of um, TikTok videos about, you know, kind of my judgment of these songs <laughs> and which ones I enjoyed the most having watched them live. <laughs> and the amount of abuse I got oh. on, <laughs> on the really? internet. From certain countries who were not best pleased oh. with me not liking their song. <laughs> Tell you what, if you very wa- serious though. Yeah, some people take it very, very seriously, very seriously. Yeah, but yeah, if you if you want if you want a video to go viral, just you know, say you don't like a particular country song, and they will come for you in their droves and boost the views of that video significantly. <laughs> Well, what does it they say? Any publicity is good publicity. Exactly. It also didn't help that I accidentally mislabeled two of the countries. <laughs> oh, well, you're not. So then half the comments are like, that's not Portugal, that's Poland, you idiot. And I'm like, oh, sorry, whoops. <laughs> I quite like Portugal's <laughs> song, so it was quite good. I did too. That was one of my favourites. I thought yeah. it was vocally quite impressive. Yeah, yeah. There were some good songs there. It was... It well, was, we it were... Was, it was Albania that I didn't like. Oh. <laughs> Well, see, my partner has never actually watched Eurovision, like, from start to finish. What? Like, I know. I was like, really? So we watched it on the Saturday. We caught the end of the semi-final on the Wednesday, the scoring, and then we watched the final on the Saturday. And like we were saying, we were impressed by, like, because like, I have memories of watching it as a kid, and it was all the novelty acts and, you know, that kind of and stuff. And there were still a couple of those. Yeah. <laughs> But like we were impressed with how serious, like, this, like, and how good the songs were. You know, there was... actually, I have to say, I think it was a very strong year. Mm. The, the, normally, there's a few that you're like bored and you sat through them, like, oh come on. Whereas actually, this year, I felt like they were all pretty strong. Yeah, it was yeah. really, really impressive. And then the hosts were funny. I do like Graham Norton and Hannah. Was it Hannah Waddingham. Hannah Waddingham. Oh, oh, she's my new hero. I, she mm. was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, she was very funny. And very I loved because they started booing for something. She's like, not in my house. I was <laughs> like, did. good for you. Good. Yeah, it can get, the voting can get a little political at times. And it so was ruthless. People, people get a little <laughs> bit kind of touchy about that. And so what can happen is that the boos can come out. I think they started booing when San Marino gave Italy their 12 points. Yeah. Because, and it's all like, well, they're actually kind of in Italy. So, you know, the proximity thing there, everyone went, boo. I'm like, no, it's okay. The voting, but we, were, we did comment. The voting was ruthless, we thought. It was like, some of it was a bit mean-spirited, you know. What is it? They, we, I mean, like, we never do any good anyway. But, like, some of the other countries, you were, like, were good entries and they're like two points. And you're like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, oh, Germany did not do that. too well. And, yeah, I think they deserved a few more than they got. But there we go. Yeah. At the same time, I didn't vote for Germany. My favourite was Belgium. I really like Belgium as well. I got Jamiroquai vibes from that one. That was yeah, really good. Yeah, I liked that one. I saw that one live because he was in the semi final that I saw. Yeah, he was good. And I was thought he good. was really good. Yeah. But there we go. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I like. We'll, we'll um, start blabbering again. I could, I could talk about Eurovision for hours. We could have done a Eurovision special. Given that it was a song competition, we could have talked about the voices. Mm. 
Maybe we should still. Well, actually, that was one of the points that I was making, that people were getting angry with me. They're like, you're a singing teacher and you're rating this song really high and it's the rubbish vocal and this song have got a much better vocal. Why didn't you rate them higher? And I was like, well, actually, it's a song competition. It's about the not song. a singing competition. And sometimes a really good song has a really simple vocal to it. And yeah. that was a point that they were like, no. But then when I did another video rating them purely on vocals, people weren't as interested. Really, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't do so well. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, somebody's musical theatre audition class and they were like, don't. Oh, it was Fiona. Fiona McDougall, who works for Andrew Lloyd Webber, and she was saying, she's like, don't come in with the note that you can only hit like two out of ten times. She's like, because you think you need no. to show off. She's like, come in with something mm -hmm. that you can hit like nine out of ten times, standing on your head upside down. Absolutely. She's like, and that's more impressive than the kind of like, oh, is it going to work or not? So yeah, yes. simpler. Simple is better sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Heather, who is our guest today on the podcast? So today we are talking to the lovely Marcy Rosenberg, mm. um, who is a, a speech language pathologist and lovely, 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 lovely lady. Lots. Of, she has written a fantastic book, uh, The Vocal Athlete. Mm. Um, and so we were talking to her about all things voice voice disorders and rehab and you know what she does in her job and how it works being an SLP and working with singers um and she had some really interesting ideas to share she did yeah and as always we struggled for time because there was just so many things to talk about <laughs> yes this is gonna be a three-hour podcast by the time <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and cut it down a little bit so yeah. it's not too long but you know we'll keep all the good stuff don't you worry yeah so over there let's talk to Marcy then let's do it so Marcy thank you so much for joining us today for our podcast we really are looking forward to chatting to you getting to know you a little bit better um, I wondered if you wouldn't mind starting telling us just a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the vocal world Ah, okay. So I was one of those um, child performers. So I did quite a lot of regional theater commercials, that kind of stuff when I was a younger kid, and then just continued doing that all throughout high school. And so when I graduated, I went to Interlochen Arts Academy, which is a which is a boarding school for the arts. So I went there my oh, senior cool. year and was a voice major. So from there, I just went right into a conservatory for my Bachelor of Music in Voice. And um, I spent four years at Peabody Conservatory studying classical vocal performance. And um, during that time, I really started to become interested in the medical aspects of voice. And even my teachers from when I was younger used to tell me that I would ask very, very specific questions <laughs> in my lessons about what was happening. And, 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 and oftentimes they didn't actually really know how to answer my questions. So um, I took a vocal pedagogy class in my senior year at Peabody Conservatory. And during that time I was all... I was already knowing that I was not going to plan to pursue graduate work in classical vocal performance. I knew that I was not interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. and honestly, I should have gone the musical theater route because that that's really more that's actually really more where, where I am suited and more where my where my heart lies. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably should have done that, but uh, you know, Interlochen was very classically based, and I just sort of funneled into that path because that's what most of those um, voice majors were doing. But I knew that I did not want to pursue graduate work in classical vocal performance. So around that time, also, I was actually having some issues with my voice. So I really became keenly focused on the vocal health aspects 
of um, pedagogy. And so whenever we would have a paper assignment or so we had to write something, I would always choose a vocal health topic and start reading books about it. And I think it all came to a head when we did a field trip to a clinic that is very much like the clinic that I now work in. And so I went into this clinic and they were doing a study on singers. So I participated as a volunteer in a study and I got to have a scope and all of that stuff happened within like a two week time frame. And I was just blown away that there was an entire field that was dedicated to voice and health and singing and the, you know, the very specific kinds of things that I wanted to know about voice, there was actually information about that. It did exist. And this field, the, the, the singing voice specialist field, the clinical singing voice specialist, there's, there, there are no formal names for that in the United mm -hmm. States, you are probably aware. It was a pretty young field at that time. And my, my mentor, Thomas Hauser, uh, who I worked with actually my senior year was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He said to me, what are you going to do when you graduate from Peabody? And I said, I, I, I actually don't know, but I really am I'm discovering this, this, this whole field of, of voice and speech pathology and vocal health. And he said to me, you need to go and become a speech pathologist and so that you can work with voice and you can do rehabilitation with voice. And honest to God, it was like the clouds opened and the, oh, <laughs> the angels sang. And I swear to you, I was like, my whole energy changed. And I remember in that instant, I was driving home from that voice lesson. It was two hours because Lancaster was two hours outside of Baltimore, where Peabody is. That whole way home in the car, I just remember thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to be. I know what I'm going to be when I grow up. I know what I'm going to do. And I, and I really, I would say within a couple of weeks, had enrolled into um, a local uni state university in Maryland to go right into my second bachelor's degree for speech language pathology um, wow. and for that following year. And then I went and did research at the National Institutes of Health for a year with Christy Ludlow in her voice and speech lab. Um, and then sort of eventually went on to grad school at Bowling Green uh, State University. And I was really lucky to just fall into the hands of really wonderful mentors. Tom Hauser was probably the first one that I would credit. Christy Ludlow at the National Institutes of Health and then Ron Scher at um, Bowling Green State University. I mean, those were all po really powerhouse names uh, in the voice science uh, field. And that was just, I and mean, I, you know, w wasn't even through with graduate school yet. So I just think the stars aligned. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing my graduate rotation, I was doing that externship. It was a six month rotation. I did that at University of Michigan. And uh, I never left. <laughs> so <laughs> I rotated as a student there. And because I had that background of a, a degree in vocal performance and speech pathology, at that time, that combination was considered really unique mm. and, and sort of rare, um, which is funny because now it's the base it is the baseline of what is expected if one is going to work in the clinical realm for singers in speech pathology. So I don't know even that I would have hired me with only a bachelor's degree in vocal performance. Now the expectation honestly is a master's degree in vocal performance or you know, an MFA in theater or musical theater, something beyond just undergrad in addition to speech pathology to work in a clinic like mine. But they hired me right out of graduate school because of that combination and they wanted somebody who would work for singers. Now, just to give you perspective, I was pregnant with my first daughter. Oh my word. Time. She just yesterday graduated from the University of Michigan's musical <laughs> theater department. I love that circle <laughs> so of life. Cool. So, and I have been at the vocal health center 
that entire time, and I am very closely aligned with the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Our clinic collaborates with the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. I go into the musical theater department monthly for vocal health labs. I work with those students all of the time, and so there's just a it's just sort of a wonderful kind of full circle. Um, moment. So yes, I was sobbing as I was watching her perform on the stage and graduating <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but that's sort of the long version of how I ended up um, where I ended up. And I and I and I know though I do love to perform also, um, but my heart and soul is really in voice training. Whether right. it's habilitation or rehabilitation, that if you asked me what are you? I would say I'm a teacher. I'm a voice trainer. I am a speech mm -hmm. pathologist. I do do rehabilitation, but it's a to me it's a much bigger picture than that. And so, so, when I teach, so I what? What does an average day at work look like for you okay. then? So, a really um, an average day is probably. Um, so we do a multidiscipline, I'll pick a Wednesday because that's our multidisciplinary day. So we see our multidisciplinary patients in the morning and the multidisciplinary patients are patients who are teachers, actors, singers, lawyers, preachers. I have a sports announcer right now. I've had broadcast mm -hmm. people. I mean, all of anyone who uses their voice professionally in front of some sort of an audience mm -hmm. um, is appropriate for that clinic. And they are seen by the laryngologist. They are seen by me, the speech pathologist slash clinical singing voice specialist. And they are also seen by one of our um, voice professor colleagues at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. So there is a triad of voice care professionals who are part of that multidisciplinary team. And so we do those evaluations and then I'll spend the rest of the day doing therapy, you know, 45 minute therapy sessions sort of back to back, you know, mm -hmm. until the end of the day. And on, on a really, really busy day, I could see 12 patients back to back for 45 wow. minutes straight each. Wow. Um, you know, if we have a snowstorm, <laughs> <That's, laughs> <be patient>. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I also do general voice. So I see, you know, I always say, you know, I've seen people on Broadway stages and in the Metropolitan Opera stage, and I've seen people who sing in their shower and, mm. and they're equal. It is equally rewarding to mm. me, um, to treat both of those. I don't, but while I love the elite level singers, um, I also am honored to participate in the, in the care of somebody who just wants to be able to read to their children at night or mm -hmm. sing on their praise team, you know, on Sundays. So I think they're equally valuable. That's a, a lot of clients in a day, though, 12 back-to-back -back clients. That, that, must that, be... Would be, that would be a very, very, that would be if all okay. of my slots were filled and everybody actually show, showed up. <laughs> <laughs> showed up. It, it is Michigan, so, you know, the weather could be hit or miss. And, but still, that's a busy day, even if you were yeah. seeing half of that, you know. So how do you keep yourself healthy vocally then with that kind of workload? I, you know, well, I would say I probably just have built the stamina vocally to 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 do that. Um, but my my method, my clinical methods tend to be to have the patient do the majority of the talking and sound making in the session. Mm -hmm. And and that and that's actually a motor learning principle. You actually, you, you, I make them do most of the work, and so <laughs> I'm I'm actually not talking and lecturing at them the whole time. The majority of it is really sort of a collaborative thing. Um, and then in terms of the stamina, the voice the voice field is so interesting, and no two patients are alike. I really truly mean that because. Mm -hmm. It is, there's so much more than the actual organic diagnosis. There is so much more to that. There is the psyche of the human in front of you. There is their spirit. There is the trauma that they're experiencing because of what's happened to them and their voice. There's a whole human in front of you that is way more than just their vocal folds. Mm -hmm. And so... 
our job, I view my job as a voice trainer and rehabilitation person, is to address the entire person in front of me holistically. And so that never gets boring because everybody's different. And I and there's never a day that goes by where I don't learn something from a patient or a colleague because that's how voice is, right? You guys mm. know. It's a dynamic process. It's a dynamic instrument. And so it just doesn't get old. Yeah, no. absolutely. Um, what What is the most kind of, I suppose, common issue that you find people are coming in with at the moment? Yeah, so I would say... Phonotraumatic lesions, very common. We call them lumps and bumps. <laughs> That's a fancy term that our laryngologists <laughs> use. But, you know, that would be things like vocal fold nodular swelling. Um, and, you know, that's a spectrum, right? So, so you have zero here, yeah, trace amount of midfold fullness, Maybe some swelling, uh, mild lesions, moderate broad, ba le broad base lesions that it sort of goes on there. And so they're, you know, they're somewhere on that spectrum. That's very common. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we see idiopathic um, paresis, so weakness of a vocal mm -hmm. fold. Um, that happens, and um, that, that's not nearly as common as phonotraumatic lesions, but it is definitely something that happens. Um, a lot of post-COVID hmm. issues. So COVID has really created an entirely new population of patient, not just for mm. voice, but for otolaryngology clinics in general. So posterior glottic stenosis, breathing issues, functional breathing disorders. There's a, a whole new cohort of patients and the same amount of care providers. So the patient load just went up and the care providers are the same. And mm. so there's now that disconnect with ac accessibility and all of that kind of thing. So, so the Odo clinics are... Um, are really, really, really busy. Our laryngologists, are, they already are working incredibly hard, but I just feel like they are constantly going to just accommodate um, all of this. So there is a COVID component to some of the long haul symptoms of people, you know, everybody came out of their shell and back started performing again. And for a while, there were a lot of patients who were just incredibly deconditioned a, because they had COVID and we were all quarantining and not doing our normal thing. Now that we've all, we've got a year, a year and a half under our belt of a little bit more normal routine, I see that um, lessening. But for a while there, That's there was good. quite a bit of that. There was quite a bit of that just reconditioning, uh, even if you didn't have COVID, mm. uh, just from not doing it. Yeah. Just from yeah. lack of use. Yeah. And mm. exercise physiology, you know, we all stopped going to the gym <laughs> and we all got out of shape. And so mm -hmm. same thing can happen with your voice. So luckily that's not really as much of an issue now. I'm, ha I'm happy to say. But people are starting to get back into the routine yeah. of it, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Oh, interesting. So when you're talking about the various types of lesions that you might come across, do you tend to approach those all in a very similar way, or do you tend to approach them differently according to how extreme the lesion is? So that's a, I love that question. Here is what I will say. There, is, there are the biomechanics of voice production. And those principles are fairly similar across the board, right? You know, coordinating uh, the respiratory system, the sound source system, the resonating system, the articulators, and and getting efficient biomechanics. Um, so the exercises that we that we tend to use can be very similar. Lots of semi occluded vocal tract stuff. Lots of um, Lots of balancing of, of efficiency so that we're not using all of this and we're taking advantage of the larger muscle groups and resonance and acoustics to get more bang for the buck. But I think what, what tends to be more specific is tailoring it, the exercise in terms of how you teach it 
based on what the patient is able to receive and integrate and execute correctly. Mm-hmm. And so the, so really it's not the exercise. It's not like, okay, moderate vocal fold nodules. Let me pick out that sheet. This is what we do for that. Mm-hmm. It's really not that straightforward in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's really more, okay, I've got Tom in front of me. Tom has, um, you know, mild mid fold swelling, but, uh, but Tom is also on a national tour of Jesus Christ superstar. And so he's singing high rock stuff constantly and um, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm taking his knees into account and right. what's happening with him psychologically in terms of what is he able to, how much information can he really handle at once before he gets overwhelmed, shuts down. So that to me is where the art and craft of voice training comes into play. And th- that is something that you just learn over time with experience. But mm-hmm. that to me makes the difference between a truly good voice trainer and somebody who understands the exercises and can do the exercises and teach them. But that nuance and that holistic approach is missing. And it's a, it's, it's, it can be very nuanced. It can be very subtle. It's the meta component of um, of the voice rehabilitation that I think is what gets very specific, not the exercise. Mm, I love, I love that. that. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's the art of teaching in general, really. Isn't I it? think so. It's, it's, Absolutely, it's the same. It's no different for voice training and voice teaching, and mm-hmm. what it is for rehab. I think. <laughs> Sorry, so, um, in the um, in the workshop that you did for us. Yeah. Um, you were working with a couple of our teachers with straws. Uh-huh. And one of the things that you were pointing out is that not every singer who uses a straw uses it to its advantage. And I just wonder, I just thought that there was some really useful knowledge in that. I just wondered whether you could speak just a little bit about some of the common mistakes maybe singers make because we see these, they're plastered all over the internet. Get your straw, do your straw exercises. <laughs> yes but they're not always making the most of it. So um, I just wondered if you could kind of maybe run through some of the common mistakes that we might be making at home. Absolutely. And I will say with the caveat for those who watch this in perpetuity, these are Marcy's opinions about what mistakes are. <laughs> Based on, you know, 22 years of clinical experience, but right. it's just, Mar- you know, these are Marcy's thoughts and opinions. What I would say is the most common mistake that I see singers making when they are using a straw is that they go right to singing. <laughs> so when I say, when somebody comes into my clinic and they say to me, um, I always ask, hey, do you ever, have you ever done any straw stuff with a straw? Or has your teacher ever taught you straw phonation? Oh, yeah, I like, I watched that video on YouTube. And, and, and there actually are some good videos on YouTube, but it's missing that meta component. You can't, you can't learn that just by imitating. There's, there's way too much of an experiential component that doesn't tend to happen if you're just copying instructions. So the probably one of the most common mistakes is that I will see singers, I'll hand them a straw and I always say, show me how you use this. Let me see what you do. And very frequently I will get something along the lines of like a really high glide or they'll just do random five note scales and I always, I always start with um, something way more boring than that. I always start with just speech range in, a, in an, oh, wow, part of your voice um, that is a natural, authentic pitch range for you if you were responding to somebody with an, oh, wow, kind of thing. And a very slow, in that range of their speak, whatever that is for their speaking voice, so that they can really experientially start to understand, oh, 
okay, easy here, lots of buzzing here. It sounds, and I give gestures to go with it so that they remember when they're at home mm. coaching mm -hmm. themselves. This is the checklist, easy in the throat, buzzy vibration here on your fingertips, sounds stable, not breathy. I don't want to hear any air coming through the straw. It travels across the room. So sort of those cues, but... If you go right, if you skip right to higher level, higher gear singing, you miss all that. And mm -hmm. so you're not necessarily going to apply it to there if, if your body and your nervous system doesn't understand what that is for the stuff that you're actually doing 80% of the time, which is speaking. So to me, that's probably the biggest mistake. Other mistakes are that it's way too breathy, it's way too airy, it's way too mm -hmm. quiet. It's not meant to be breathy, airy, and quiet. It is meant to be good, moderate volume that is not breathy at all. That doesn't mean you're not using airflow efficiently. But there is definitely such a thing as too much airflow, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, especially in that part of the voice. And airflow can work against you depending on on your style, right? So we use airflow very differently in a classical style than we do in a more contemporary or in a speaking mode. So I, those are probably some of the biggest things. I just had an elite level um, classical singer in my clinic this month who is a phenomenal singer. I mean, they, they have a, a, a stellar instrument. They have a wonderful technique. And they also did the whole going up into the, and even though it was not inefficient, it wasn't breathy, it wasn't, you know, when I readjusted back down to more of just the speech level for this singer, there we, the face went, oh, <laughs> oh, got it. Oh, okay. You know, it was just a whole process that unfolded. And um, so it just goes to show you that I, I, I think that the straw is sort of like all the rage, right? The, mm -hmm. Like the straw is the new black kind of, you know, thing. Um, <laughs> so everybody uses them and they're great. I mean, and I, you know, voice teachers have been using, using semi-occluded vocal tract exercise for hundreds of years. It's not new. Mm -hmm. um, I would say Ingo Tietze probably is responsible for putting it at the forefront in the voice science sort of space field. Yeah. Um, so they're wonderful, but it is just a tool. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't understand what is my goal with this, why am I giving this to my student? What do I want them to understand when they are sitting by themselves in the practice room, practicing it? You know, you have to know why you're doing an exercise and even if you're doing the same exercise, even if I'm doing the same exercise for you as I'm doing for, for Tom, that's, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that the cueing experience is going to be the same. Um, so that, that's what I would say about the straw. It, it is a tool, but it can be really a fabulous tool if you don't get too fancy with it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do you find, though, like, because obviously there are, like Heather said, there are, you know, lots of different types plastered over the internet. Do you find that there's a certain size or diameter that works better for people, or is it does it depend on the person? It depends on the person. And there are, there are definitely studies that have to do with, like, if you're a very tall person with a long neck, you know, versus somebody like me who's 5'1", and, you know. But what I would say is this. I start, I tend to start with a general drinking diameter. Now, Ingo would tell you to start with a cocktail mm -hmm. diameter. What I find is that my, my clinical experience is such that if one has a lot of squeezing already in tension, a really narrow diameter could work against them initially and create a little more lockup because now they're trying to push their nervous system doesn't understand how to generate sound now through this really narrow space. So we get like foot on the gas pedal a little bit too much. Um, so I tend to start with a drinking diameter to get them to understand so that they have their aha moment with, okay, I understand what, what, what we're looking for. I understand what I'm trying to experience with this. Mm -hmm. And then, then I move it. 
to different diameters. Um, so that's how I do it. Um, I don't think you can say you're a, you know, six foot tall who sings in the baritone range. Therefore, this is the straw that you're going to do. Um, I, 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 that's how you, you know, we have to be very specific when we're doing research and when we're studying things. But going back to what we were talking about earlier with the human in front of you is their own person with lots going on. Mm -hmm. And you, everything has to be tailored to what walks in the door and what is sitting in front of you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it, it depends on people's initial habits as well. If, you're, if your habit is to sing with excessive amounts of air, then a small diameter would give you more resistance, might be more beneficial yep. than if you're someone who doesn't let enough air flow through, in which Absolutely. case you're going to need something to encourage that. So, right. you know... And the um, other I, thing is, when you start with a larger straw, you can pinch it, hmm. give more resistance. That's a good point, yeah. That's the other Unless thing. you buy a metal one. The UK, <laughs> we can't get plastic straws in the UK anymore. I know. It's all, it's well, all banned. <laughs> I, I, have, I struggle with that. We do have paper straws. They're not as... They're not the same, are they? They're not the yeah. same, yeah. But you can also, to that end, yet you can pinch a drinking straw if it's pinchable. You can also stack cocktail straws. Right, right. So oh. you can do three cocktail straws, mm -hmm. right, and then mm. remove. I so there are more. Show you. Yeah, I accidentally oh, yeah. ordered these ones from because they're plastic. I had to order them from China, and they came, and they're actually three cocktail straws already, kind oh. of glued oh. together. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny I'm like wow okay we'll find someone and you can also say that we cut you can cut straws at, in half the length is not as important as the diameter in terms okay. of what the voice producer is experiencing so um, and I do ask my patients to keep track of their straw cut it in half bring it back you know it's not yeah. ideal it's not ideal environmentally I do know that I do know that I am. Um, after your, the webinar you did for us, I had a conversation with uh, Carmel, who you had worked with, um, the female singer. And uh, the thing that blew her mind was just the, the, the speed, like because she went way too fast and you had her slow way down and she was struggling to go that slow. And, mm -hmm. and so when she had some time to process it after, she's like, I never thought like, you know, you just presume like Ooh, up and down. And she's like the slowness, it really clicked with her after a couple of days and she really felt that big difference. And so... It just, I tried it myself and found a big difference as well. Just yep. going slow, keeping in that speaking range, it did make a big difference to it. So one of my big say, so I have, when I do lectures, I have sort of like my, like Marcy's little like rules <laughs> for voice training. <laughs> and one of the, um, probably the first one, and I say this to every patient is, slower gets you there faster. 100% of the time with voice training, slower gets you there faster. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. The tortoise wins the race. Always. The tortoise always wins the race. Because when we're going fast and we're rushing, the nervous system isn't taking notes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when the teacher writes something up on the board. And they say, now, this is really important to make sure you get this down and then give you four seconds to do it and then they erase it. <laughs> that to me is what's happening when you're rushing. You are not allowing the process. It is the process is what matters, not the product, which is the second thing on my list. That you have, we, you know, we get so focused on, I need to do five reps of this and I'm going to try to get as high as I can. So we're going quickly. And then we're just ignoring the process and focusing on the product the product is what what happens when we let the process unfold and that is what's so counter to our culture in general right we multitask mm. we're on our phone we're doing emails we're looking at our computer we're used to trying to be efficient and voice trainers whether it's rehab or whether it's you know in a studio setting we're also trying to be efficient right they're writing a check for you or they're you know, I'm billing an insurance company. I only have six sessions. Like, I got to be efficient. But efficient doesn't mean fast. So do you um, have a places where people can find more information about you if they wanted to find out more about your research and things? Um, well, I do have a website. Uh, 
it, it's marcy-rosenberg.com, um, which t- tends to have just general information. But, but really, what I tend to have, um, if people want to work with me privately, because I do have a have a virtual private consulting studio where I'm not doing rehabilitation, but, I, but singers tend to contact me to help sort of work with them for like five to ten sessions to kind of get them situated and back on track or have them work through some like if they're if they're needing to sort out some technical stuff get them back on track and and on their way and so you can just email me at vocalathlete at gmail.com okay. probably the best way to get a hold of me um my website tends it's not currently uh, super super updated but it tends to have like what i have coming up you know um presentations lectures and that kinds of kind of thing i'm teaching a virtual class for shenandoah the summer pedagogy institute um this summer the vocal athlete's guide to vocal fitness and wellness um which is three weeks you know two hours classes three weeks where we cover a lot of the kinds of things that we were talking about um yeah, so I would say that that's probably the best place to start. Okay, that sound, that course sounds really interesting. Actually, the summer one you mentioned, I have to have a little look yep. into that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we'll make sure we put show, uh, links in the show notes for all those those resources you just mentioned, so people can find you. Great, thank yeah. you. And we'll make sure we link to your book as well, which we haven't had a chance to mention. But I know. we, but <laughs> we will make sure that we push that for you too. There, oh, look, you've got it there. We are actually working on a third edition right now. Okay, oh, great. fab. I love that. So you keep it up to date. And mm. and, it, and the third edition will have some, some it, the third edition will definitely be different from the second edition. Some new, oh. some new chapters. Um, uh, yeah. Reorganized. So when, when should we expect that to be uh, uh, available to purchase then? Spring of 2024. Okay. Okay. Just in I would case say, people want to hold on and wait to get the new one or whether they're desperate to I mean, get this one now. <laughs> right. It depends on, uh, right. It depends on how desperate you are to have the book. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but we're excited about, we're excited about doing the third edition. So. Yeah, great. That's excellent. Yeah. I don't know how you fit it all in amongst all of those people and <laughs> writing the book and oh my word. <laughs> how it just, I don't know. I don't know either. I have to be very structured when I'm in this kind of a zone of like, all right, on these days I have to go outside of my house. I got to leave my house, go to a library, sit, write down what I'm doing so I don't get shiny ball syndrome and start mm-hmm. working on some other chapter. Like, nope, I am only working on chapter two <laughs> and <don't laughs> stay disciplined. I'm doing that, you know, um, that's, that's how I have to do it because I get very, like, I get very shiny ball, you know, I get, I go down rabbit holes, you yeah, know. Me too. And, right. <laughs> So. Very easily done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us today. It's been it fabulous to thank you get so to much know for you. Having me. I enjoyed doing the webinar and I, and I look forward to interacting with you guys um, in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, we're looking forward to your webinar at our upcoming conference yes. in uh, just a few short weeks' time. So I'm excited mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. I am. Great. Motor learning, right? That's mm-hmm. the one. That's yeah. it. Great topic. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. So that was our chat with Marcy. And uh, she has a wealth of information, wasn't she? Like there were so many things that we could have gone down the rabbit hole of there. And I love finding out, you know, what what the average day looks like for somebody in because although we work in a a similar business, I guess. It's a very different stream of, you know, what her working day looks like versus what my working day might look like. And it's really just interesting to see, you know, how things work. Um, and obviously, because she's tied to the university, she's still doing lots of kind of research and discovery. And um, so still lots of, you know, fresh ideas coming from her, which is fantastic. She must have a thick notebook because you must find that like sitting writing, you must be teaching sometimes and then something comes to your mind, you're like, oh, research, right? And then you have to stop and write stuff down because, you know, those kind of things once they come to you. Absolutely. And I think we mentioned this in our interview, but that, you know, she kind of made me really rethink straw work. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way she was like, 
Too many people are going straight to, you know, super long stretches. Let's go to the highest note we can go. But actually, let's just kind of make sure we cement things lower down first. And I'm like, well, that seems so self-explanatory when she says it like that. And I'm like, well, that's how we work with voice teachers. You know, if there's something wrong with the bottom of the voice, we 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 work there first. Yeah. And then we go on to join it to the top. So why do we think that as soon as we pull a straw out, we ought to be doing it differently? No, it makes total sense. Let's just get yeah. the bottom of the voice sorted first. So, yeah, it really did make me think, hmm, have I been doing I might have been, you know, falling into that trap at times. They're going, oh, well, you're nice and safe. You've got a straw. Let's go straight for a big stretch. Um, well, that's the thing, though. It's like any exercise. There's scope to do it wrong. There's scope to teach it wrong. You know, absolutely. and so... Sometimes it just takes somebody to turn around and say, actually, no, like, let's just reset the thought on this. Like, this is still a useful tool if you use it the right way. You know, and I keep my little you straw now on my there. desk. Good. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, like, because I was doing a webinar the other day and it's a, one that we do every month. It's like a welcome to IVA webinar to welcome new teachers. And the first right. time the, the, the previous month, I sat with my straw and just, you know, kind of in the bottom of my voice and did the webinar. It was great. I forgot to do it before this webinar and halfway through it, my voice started going like this. I was like, oh, <clears throat> forgot my straw. Mm-hmm. But afterwards, yeah. got the straw out for like 30 seconds and doing the stuff that she recommended made massive difference to how quickly yeah. my voice recovered. Yeah. So it just goes to show that, you know, stop, slow down, take it easy before you try and ascend Absolutely. through your 19th passage with your straw. <laughs> you know, wait till you're a bit more warmed up for that. We're so impatient. We want it all now. That's our problem, isn't it? <laughs> I know. But yeah, I think you're right when there's a kind of, because there's a probably a mindset, oh, it's a straw, it's safe, I can get away with more That's with it. it, that you probably think that you can push it harder than you should be. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, that was a bit of a kind of a light bulb moment for me where I'm thinking, oh, I think I need to go and re-examine some of what I've done and what I'm doing. And I love those moments. I love it, personally. I'm like, yes. Well, you saw it in the webinar she did when she worked with the two singers on the straws and they were both, you could see when they were like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow, that feels better. Like you could see their, the light bulb going off in their heads when they experienced it. Absolutely. And, you know, like this comes back to that point that we always talk about. It's why, it's why it's so important to have practical application when you're working on learning how to teach voice. Because if you yes. don't, if they hadn't experienced that moment, they wouldn't have gone away now for the benefit of their students. They would have been like, oh, yeah, more. It's just information. But now they've experienced it and seen the benefits. They're like, OK, that really does work. Yeah, and they could take right. it away and assimilate it into their teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Um so yeah, that yeah. that webinar that she did for us, people can still access that, can't they, Tom? Oh yeah, they can purchase the recording of that yeah. via our website, vocaladvancement.com or if you're finding this on YouTube, there will be a link in the show notes description in the box below to Marcy's webinar that you can purchase. And there's a little cheeky discount code. If you look for it in the description, you can have $5 off, you know, because we're nice. Like that. Yes. That's very generous of us, Tom. I know. It's, <laughs> and you know why we're generous? It's because it's EvaCon day today, at the time of recording. Oh, it is, isn't it? Yes. It is. It's day one of conference, about to kick off in a few short hours. Absolutely. We'll see. My hair will not look this neat and... by the time we get to the start. Cause well, I, I was going to say, because this, this we've got a few coming up, haven't we? This one is in the <laughs> US time zone, which means that, you know, all of our Late participants nights. in America are still in bed at the moment while we are up, you know using our morning wisely yes, uh, but it prep. does mean that the the classes for us will be going on until well into the wee hours of yes. the morning <laughs> yes it'll be about 3 a.m by the time we get done tonight for the next four days Woohoo! <laughs> no and then somebody said let's do a conference for asia time zone and then realized that that starts at 5 a.m our time so it's like that's you know, even worse. Both ends. <laughs> yeah. I would much rather stay up to 5 a.m. than get up for 5 a.m. Yeah. Mornings are not my thing. Whoever scheduled that should be fired. <laughs> I think it was you, was it not, Tom? <laughs> no. Shh. Don't be silly. <laughs> that was Tom had a good moment without realizing the implications of the good idea. <laughs> oh, my word. Well, the people in Asia and Australia will thank us for it, I'm sure. They're under pain of death to turn up. Yes, <laughs> quite. If I'm sitting on my own at 5am, I will not be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
warm up for one with Tom. <laughs> I fully oh intend to do the news presenter thing where you sit with a nice shirt on and pajama bottoms on <laughs> ah. camera. <laughs> well, why not? No one needs yeah. to see what's going on down there. It's all good. Exactly. And then you'll discover in the warm up, like, everybody stand up. And Everyone like, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my camera's not working. Not. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Oh, oh, I but love yeah, it. It's going to be a fun week. And EvaCon is always a fun week. Uh, you know, the people coming together from around the world. We get to see all of our faces of our teachers and come together as a community. So it's always nice to see everybody and hear what they've it been up is. to. It's usually fun. It's usually quite, you know, kind of, you know, community building. And oh, well actually, as, Marcy, yeah. that we've just been talking to, is one of our guest speakers this she week. She is. We loved her so much, we brought her back to yeah. our conference. Yeah, she's going to do a wonderful session on motor learning, that I'm really yes. looking forward to. Absolutely, me too. That should yeah. be a good one. I think she's um, on day three, is she? No? Yes, she's on day three, because today is Kerry. Kerry is joining us today. That's right, yes. So it's going to be a great week full of that It kind is of going to be a great week full of lots of practical learning, lots of new, you know, ideas and, yeah, getting to know people, which is always fun. Yeah. So, yeah. It's fun. Um, and then, so who's on our next podcast, Tom? Well, in our next podcast, we are, are talking to the lovely Dana Lentini, who did Aww. a wonderful webinar for us about teaching children and working with kids. And Yeah, we had she some was, really good feedback on that one. Mm -hmm. But as well, she was lovely to talk to. Like, you know, we could have, again, we could have talked to her for hours and hours on so many different things. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, that was a nice episode. So make sure that you find wherever you listen to your podcast and you subscribe to the Vocal Advancement podcast so you find out when Dana's interview comes up. Yes. And uh, if you want to watch the shenanigans, as they say on YouTube, then you know these videos are on our YouTube channel for you to watch in all their technicolor glory. Absolutely, yes. Why, why wouldn't you want to watch us chatting away? I know. It makes um, the experience so much, you know. We should have had fancy dress for this episode. We should have done Eurovision <laughs> fancy dress. I could have put my sequins back on. Yeah. I would have got I think I would have got the outfit from was it Austria? You know the, the glasses that was in the songbook that they did at the interval that you know the really strange Yes. You know the one I mean. I know what you mean. I can't remember their name. If I can find <laughs> if I can remember, I'll put a link in the show notes to the video of that because it's a fun performance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening today. Thank you for joining us in our ramblings. Uh, yeah. I hope you found it informative, entertaining, um, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you listen to us again. Yeah. And, you know, if you're listening and you're a Eurovision fan, put a comment in the, in the uh, YouTube description. Tell us your favourite country from Eurovision. Yeah, who should have won? Mm-hmm. Did you like the winner? Did you not? Mm, yeah. Controversy over that one. Yeah, and we're a bit like this over the winner. It's growing on. I us, wasn't I sure. I wasn't sure. It's growing I on. Think us. I think I preferred other entries. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Me too. But you know, it is growing on us. My kids keep playing it over it's and over. It's number two in the top ten currently in the UK. Exactly. Yeah. It's been played by a lot of people. Obviously. Mm -hmm. I can see the appeal, but it wasn't for me. No. I think I like but Belgium more. Go. I liked Belgium more. They didn't There's so many good ones, actually. as well as they should have. Yeah, there were some good ones. It was the Belgium like, felt like a proper, proper pop song, like proper pop anthem. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see Kylie singing that on stage with, surrounded by dancers. Yes. Kylie, yes. if you're listening, record that for us, please. Ah. <laughs> 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 oh. well, there we go. Thank you very it. much. Yeah. We'll, have a good we will leave you to get on with your day. <laughs> yeah, have a good day. Thanks for joining us and check us out next time. <laughs>